Welcome back, everybody, to the Classic Rock Podcast. Coming up on the show today, I'm joined by Doug Aldridge and John Karabi of The Dead Daisies. Now, big month coming up for the guys. They've got a brand new album out. It's called Light Em Up. It is coming in the first week of September. I've been listening to it over the last, what, week or so. Brilliant album. Much more of an organic rock album than the two previous with uh, Glenn Hughes, of course, uh, Radiance and Holy Grand. As great as those albums were, and they were really good, this, as I said, more of an organic rock feel to it. And John Karabi, I think he really is the, the voice of the Dead Daisies, really, isn't he? Also, if you're in the UK and around Europe, the boys are back out on tour. You can see the UK dates on the screen behind me for full details of all of the venues they're going to be playing at and to get details of the tickets those that are left and upgrades vip meets etc etc go to the dead daisies website now you missed any of the previous editions you can catch up online www.theclassicrogpodcast.com is where you'll find them all including the last show with chris slade the former drummer of acdc what a career he's had we got right the way back to the to the beginning we was playing in the men's clubs in south wales behind a vocalist who'd go on to become a bit of a star in his own right his name was uh, tom jones yeah that tom jones and that is where chris's career actually began before he went on to work with man from man's earth band uriah heat the firm with jimmy page in it dave gilmore gary moore and then landing the ACDC gig for the production of that album, The Razor's Edge, and multiple tours. Uh, so you can catch up with that on the website or the Facebook page, or indeed on the YouTube channel. Uh, back to today's show. I caught up with Doug Aldridge and John Karabi from their respective homes in Nashville and LA. Last week, we talked about Everything Daisies, past, present, and the future, including this new blues album that's going to be seeing the light of day in 2025. To take us there, though, here is the latest track from Light Em Up. The camaraderie, the old bikes, you know, it is a brotherhood. What you represent to them is freedom. What the hell's wrong with freedom, then? That's what it's all about. But talking about it and being it, it's two different things.
four decades now, basically, for the pair of you in this business. And you're again poised on this album release. You've got the tour going on, which is going to arrive in the UK uh, very shortly. Do you still get the same buzz, the same sense of excitement now that you always had? Um, yes. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, and I, I have to say this without sounding weird. It's, it's always good for us to come to the UK um, and, and even Europe and just, you know, because the reception that we've gotten, you know, has just been awesome. Um, I, I, I remember the last, uh, I think the last show that we did together, at, you know, as the Dead Daisies was, we played the Coco Theater in mm. in London and it was brilliant it was amazing so the UK has always kind of embraced everything that we've done like right from the beginning so it's always good to go over there and play for play for everybody and and then again Doug and I do enjoy our Guinness and uh, <laughs> bangers and mash and stuff like that as well so that's always a plus as well <laughs> yeah I, I definitely feel like I um, I get the same feeling I, I was thinking about it you know it was like when I, because I've been doing a bunch of interviews talking about me and John knowing each other since we were kids or since, the, you know, late seventies when I met him and we used to go down and see John play down in the club in Jersey. And, and I, it was exciting, you know, going out on a Friday night to see, um, see John play or to like every other day, um, I would be on the weekend, you know, practicing music and, grabbing my guitar and trying to learn how to get a guitar sound better and just the whole thing and it's still the same now i'm over 60 and it's still the same i'm still trying to get my sound right i'm still trying to get better i love to play guitar and and i get to work with this guy it doesn't suck man it's pretty good david's message to to you john last year was let's go out let's have some fun Let's write some killer music, play some killer shows, and do it all without killing ourselves. So, I mean, this, this was a big thing, wasn't it? Because you didn't want to suffer the same type of, of burnout this time around. No, well, you yeah. know, it, it's just weird, like, for all of us. I, I, I mean, you know, if, if you really look at what we accomplished between... Uh, honestly, 2015 and, you know, January of 19, when I, I, you know, told the guys, like, I, I just needed a break. Um, <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, I tell everybody, like, prior to me joining the band in 15, uh, I just got married in, like, August of 2014. Uh, my son moved from LA to Nashville to play drums for my solo band. And then literally like three or four months later, you know, we were out doing our thing and whatever. And then the Daisies called and I wound up joining the band and I started with them really truly started in like March. And we did our first record immediately went on tour and you know, we finished the year up. Richard and Dizzy obviously went back to Guns N' Roses. Doug came into the picture. And instead of continuing to tour and promote that record, we went right back in and did another record. So we technically did two albums in the first year that I was in the band and then all the touring. And and then after that, it was like tour, 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 record. Tour, 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 record. <laughs> and, you know, by the end, it was like I had my son in one ear telling me, you suck. I moved to Nashville to be in your band, and I and now I don't see you at all. And then every time I would come home from a tour, my wife would be standing in the doorway with a gun because she didn't recognize me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was just like, I, I, I told David and Doug and our management, I just said, look, man, I'm... I'm I'm sorry. I, I, I thank you guys for everything, but I, I just need a fucking break here for a minute. 
and just get off this carousel. And I went and I worked, you know, but I kind of did it at my own pace, you know, but then COVID hit and, and uh, it was funny. Last year I was on tour, David called and he came down here to Nashville and he said, like, we want to bring the fun back. Um, he, <laughs> he basically was like, okay, you're, you're com a complete fool on stage. We love it. <laughs> um, you're the voice of the daisies and you know, are you rested? And I was like, yep, I'm good to go. And he assured me that, you know, the reason why he put the band together was for not just the audience to have fun, but for all of us individually to have fun. And he said, I want to do this, but I want to be smarter now and not yeah. have anybody get burnt out. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I, you, I, 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 I honestly, to be honest with you, I think they've taken it so far the other way that I'm like, I think we could play a little more, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> it's all good. So the album light them up it, it, it feels like the the natural successor to burn it down yeah it, it's um you know it's full it's like starting fresh and but coming full circle and starting fresh again like mm. you know with the, as john said in the beginning of 16 we worked on make some noise together and it was a really cool thing it was like a family vibe you know and the way that we wrote songs, the way that Marty produced the band, everything felt really like a community where everyone's working together on the same page. Every didn't matter where the song idea came from. We were trying to make everything as best as it could be. And, you know, just naturally when you bring other people into an equation, it changes. But when we got when 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 we got with John, it just felt like, you know, being home again and we didn't I, I mean I, correct me if I'm wrong Tom but we weren't really talking about making a record it just kind of happened we, we were thinking about putting out one song John had um, I'm gonna ride and we, that was gonna kind of be the song we were gonna lead with J just have it just be like here's John Karabi I'm gonna ride you know in back in the dead daisies and then it, it turned into a full album kind of out of nothing and it was recorded really quick and everything but with Marty and John it definitely feels like at that where we jumped back three or four years back to that time again it's cool there's there's no there's no pretense here this this is a rock and roll album it's full of meaty chunky riffs it's got big anthems it's got big choruses it's all over and done with in 36 37 minutes there's no meandering eight minute tracks there's nothing prog related here it is pure rock and roll yeah, and, 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 and you know, it's 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 really weird. Like, I, I can't state this enough. Like, uh, you know, and I, I can't speak for Doug or anybody else, but for me, I've never been in a band that works as fast as we do. It, it's, it's weird. It's not unusual, uh, even lyrically. Like, if I get stumped, on something and I'm like, fuck, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to say here. You know, it's not unusual for me to go to Doug or David or, or now Michael Devin and just get an idea for a lyric, a title, give me something. You know what I mean? Um, there's really no egos in the band. Uh, mm. you know, we all contribute musically. Um, and then if I wait, need wait, help, wait, wait, John, you said there was no there was no leaders in your band. What do we, you said there's 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 no leaders in your band. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. I had to, sorry. <laughs> no, it's there's there's no egos. You know what I mean? Oh, it's we're all open <laughs> to suggestions and shit from all the other guys. Um, again, I've never even with Doug, like as brilliant as he is on guitar. I've never been involved with a guitar player that's like, hey, dude, I'm going to go do my solos. Why don't you come and sit in a room with me? And if you hear anything, just, you know, let, let me know. So, wait, Tim, Tim, wait, Crab, sorry, I have to say, because you're just going, you just brought up a really good point. And I need Tim to know the truth. 
Tim, <laughs> did you ever, Tim, did you Here ever, we go. did you ever hear that thing? It's a phrase like people would go, okay, God first, family second, I am third, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I have a little slightly different one. I have God first, family second, and John Karabi's third. Third place goes to John Karabi. He gets the bronze medal for me. I'm fourth. I'm actually fourth. So that's why I invite John to come in and basically tear me down. When I put down a solo, I'm ready for him to go, that was fucking bullshit, Doug. Come on, man. All right, Get your shit it. together. Come on. How, so, I mean, seven albums in, in 11 years. How, how difficult or how easy do you find it when you go into the studio not to replicate what you've already done? To, to come up with something that is different, something that's, you know, something that you haven't done before. I mean, is it easy for you or not? I, honestly, for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, we don't think about it. Right. You know, it's just, you know, even like with this last record, we, we set up a Dropbox folder and everybody just started throwing riffs in this thing and, and, you know, we get together and we all sit in a room, a little old school. We sit in a room with all the instruments, headphones. We're all mm -hmm. sitting there and we're just throwing ideas against the wall to see what sticks. And I think we just kind of let the songs do what they're going to do. And the cream, you know, not to sound cliche, but the cream rises to the top. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Eight, ten songs we put on the record. They're the ones that, you know, they, they, you know, it's like initial gut reaction thing, too. I think when you start overthinking things, then shit starts getting sterile. Mm. It's overthought. And we don't do that. It's a great start to the album, by the way. The, the opening track, it's always such a pivotal moment because if, if you get it wrong, it sets the tone for the, for the whole album. But the riff was fantastic. And you, you've been talking about the riff because it was, it was delivered from Steve, Stevie D from, from Buck Cherry. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had a song. It's, you know, Marty is, first of all, just to, because John, I know him. I can speak for John on this one thing for sure. I can say that Marty is an incredible musician, songwriter, and producer. Mm -hmm. So when we're working with him, it, he can take something that we know has potential and he can make it become the best it, it could have been. And it, it's great. It's such a confidence, you know, to have him and as part of the team, like the, the sixth band member. So he he produces a lot of people, as you know. He produces Buck Cherry and poor Stevie sent this song in. It was supposed to be for the Buck Cherry record. <laughs> and Marty, we were thinking about, you know, doing something up tempo. And Marty goes, man, I got this riff, man, that Stevie sent in the song. But I think the riff sounds like you guys. But I just wanted to say that, that Stevie presented that song for Buck, Buck Cherry and we stole it. And within a couple of hours, we took that riff and rewrote around it. And then John and Marty came up with the hook. And it was in a couple hours, right, John? That thing came together. Yeah. It was... Um again you know it, it, it it's really funny like i've never been in a band that puts songs together as quickly as we do and i i just mentioned this earlier and i i don't even know if doug doug realizes this but the guys came here to nashville and the amount of time that we spent together working on this record uh, there was a, a couple little things that I finished after they left, but um, the amount of time that we worked on the record, and as a side note, we didn't just do the Light em Up record. We actually did two records. So we did the Light em Up record, and then we, we did some recording down at Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals. Right. And while we were there... You know, about five thirty, six o'clock, our manager or Marty would walk through with some wine or whiskey or something, and and then we were off to the races. <laughs> but we well, you know, did a a blues record as well, which is coming next year. Wow! Uh, but we did two full records in like twenty nine days. In That's total, incredible. Yes. Yeah, so 
it, it, it's really crazy and it's a testament to you know doug and and david and michael uh you, you know uh, whatever it's just everybody's input it shit just happens fast for this band i've never done a record as quickly as i have with the dead daisies ever got no reason for looking back got to keep moving or get left behind now that that could almost be the mantra for the for the <laughs> band um you know but that's off of uh, uh, again another great track uh, times are changing but uh, a, a really really nice line i love it love that yeah yeah that's uh that's definitely um that was something that actually marty brought to the table because again like doug was saying we're not you know M marty's not just a sound guy or a mm. tone guy he's a songwriter so he had that riff and then you know he showed it to us and we all just got into the room and doug made it his own on guitar and and then um you know, worked on some lyrics. Marty and I changed a few things, but um, it's just easy, man. I, I can't explain it. I can't be any more blunt than that. So somebody was channeling. I got the feeling that their inner Rolling Stones on "I Want to Be Your Bitch" because as, as soon as that kicked in, I'm thinking this this has got such a really sleazy swagger <laughs> to it and I, I almost in in my mind i'm i can see jagger just sashaying across the city it, it's got that real rolling stones feel that's interesting i mean we don't really know we don't know what what the, you know everyone's got a different thought or feeling about it but that's cool i'm glad that it comes across like that especially the sleazy part we get that part from karabi you know it's been like that forever <laughs> <laughs> and that did feed, by the way, into, I mean, you can't help it, can you? Because you've been involved in the music industry for, for four decades each. Your influences are bound to come through. So I rolled off of the, 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 the Stones vibe and it fed into a, a bit of an ACDC vibe on uh, the road anthem, I'm, I'm going to ride. I mean, you know, it just it just had a bit of an Angus thing going I mean, this is all a good thing, by the way. Well, that was a, that was. Sorry, John. Go ahead. Go. Go. No, no go ahead. It, it's I was just going to say, John. John had that song for a while, actually, and he presented it to the band, and we didn't really understand it at the time, but then we got excited about it, and and uh, that was that was a for sure that was going to, you know, we were going to record that song, and and the interesting thing is um, that that's another song that that was written by a guy with john from buck cherry right so tell him yeah i wrote that with uh i i actually it was right before the day he called me i was in la and i got together with keith nelson mm. and i showed him the riff and he he we tweaked a few things whatever on the riff and then we recorded it at his studio and then i brought it home to work on lyrics which I never did. I never finished it. And then when the daisies were, you know, when we all got together, we created that Dropbox. I just threw it in there and I'm like, there's something cool about this track. Um, yeah. You know, I had the title, but I never actually sat down and started working on the lyrics. Um, and David honestly is really a huge ACDC fan. Uh, As he would know, be. <laughs> yeah, he's obviously Australian. So he used to have <laughs> he used to have back in black on his uh, telephone. Didn't he? That was his that was his ringtone. Was back in black. <laughs> yeah, and, and he still does. <laughs> oh, he still does. <laughs> yeah, your voice is in great shape. I mean, are you were talking about you know staying fit? You're in your sixties now, but you you obviously have. Uh, a gene, a longevity gene, because your voice is one of those. You're lucky enough that the older you get, the better it's sounding. It's got a, you know, it's got a really mature, deep feel to it, and it's it fits perfectly. And you're giving it some workout on this album. I mean, yeah, there's nothing dialed in here. You know what, though, I, like. 
I, I've had it. I've had people ask, like, oh, "What do you do, dude, to you know keep your voice?" In? And I'm like, I have no fucking idea because <laughs> I, I, pretty much I look at the things that you shouldn't do, and I go, "Well, fuck, I do all those." You know, <laughs> I, I, drinking cold soda on stage. I've smoked most of my of my life. I drink. But I think the thing of it is, is that a lot of my counterparts, I never was really excessive about anything. Mm -hmm. um, Everything you know, in moderation. I, yeah, kind of. You know, yeah, I have my moments where it's like I, you know, I go to a bar and I drink and I'm, you know, walk back to my room on my face. But um, <laughs> I... You know, it's rare. I don't really, you know, I, I don't know. I've never been like an excessive with anything. So I, that's the only thing I can attribute it to is that. And and to be honest with you, you're, you know, even though I, you know, I did the Motley thing and I've been doing this for 40 years, that, as you so eloquently stated, I, I never did like Coke or I, I, yeah. I never did any drugs. So I was always like a weed and drinking guy, you know. I got to make a mention what, what, one more track here, uh, and this is one of the, the the best tracks on the album, I think. Which and it might surprise you because it is the ballad "Love That'll Never Be," because I think it has, again, I mean, it, it has one of those classic eighties and nineties power ballad feels to it. And I'll tell you what. When Steven Tyler hears it, he'll be on the phone seeing if you can borrow that for Aerosmith. I mean, it's, you know, it sounds like a, a classic, you know, Tyler, you know, from Pump and, and Get a Grip. I mean, it's it's a great song that could turn into one of those moments where you get, you know, a surprise massive hit because somebody's included it in a movie. But great track. Well, from your mouth, it's here, buddy. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you've been involved as well, Doug, with, with um, Whitesnake. You know the power of a big rock ballad. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, every, there's all, all the benefits that come with that. And that song is, a, it's a great song. I, I think that when people hear the album, they're going to, you know, it's, it's a good, the way that um, Marty sequenced the record is really cool. Everything kind of, it feels like a, a classic 70s record, like how we grew up on. Yeah. And and so when you get to the end of it, and one of the, my favorite tracks is the last cut is uh, Take My Soul. That was a song that we were we were jamming. As John said, we'd be down at Fame Studios. We'd start having a couple of glasses of wine. We're talking about all the stuff that went down in the studio. Ultimately, it's like, hey, let's get out and jam this song. And we were jamming on what, Terraplane Blues, I think John had suggested we jam on. And then that led into that that riff and then all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, this is our own song now. And so we had that music and then John really spent a lot of his own, you know, personal time behind the scenes. And he came, he came in and he's like, man, I think I got something really deep for that. And it's a great track. I, so you get to the end of the record, you hear this really deep cut, kind of a cornerstone track. And then you're going to go back to the, the fire in the beginning. You know, it, it, it's really cool. And the end result, when you all sat down in the room and listened back to the completed album, were you surprised at what you heard? Were you surprised at the quality of what you'd put together? Was it above your expectations? You know, for, for me, it's just, I get excited about every record we've done because it's it's like to see something start with just a riff idea mm. and then somebody adds this to it the other guy adds that to it and then marty puts his two cents in and you kind of watch this thing develop um from just a riff to a song mm -hmm. you know and then we sit down and we work on melodies and you know work on the lyrics and then even when I'm doing that, like I'm singing things, Marty and I are changing shit as I'm singing it. And then he'll go, 
oh, hey, try this harmony here or try this harmony there. And it's, you know, you just watch the thing go from like a riff to a song. Um, and then when you sit back and you listen to the whole record as a whole, I just kind of sit there, even, you know, with my wife, we sat, we listened to the record a few times and even she was like, I don't know how you guys do this shit. Like, it's just like, I heard some of these riffs in the beginning mm. and now this record is fucking awesome. Like, I, it, like it, it just, and it, even with me, it ceases to amaze me how, like I said earlier, in a period of, you know, 29 days, you know, five goofballs can get into a room and just hammer shit out and come out with something, you know, that is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, it's, it's a kick-ass record. So just to watch it develop is still, I, I still, I'm still dumbfounded by the whole process. Did you have any fear, right, when you all got back together again, that the magic that was there would maybe not return because it's never easy is it to just walk back in pick up where you left off and then improve on what had gone before i would you want to I jump say, in? well i was just going to say um i definitely you know we were excited to get to be working with the team of john and marty together and i knew i knew that no matter what we came up with, it was going to be better for that team, you know. And the, mm. the 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 way that we work, as we already mentioned, we all we all got invested. We all got a stake in the game with each song, even if it comes from David Lowy or it comes from John or it comes from me or Michael. Michael came up with a great song on the record, and um, doesn't matter. We just all work on it to make it the best it could be. But the 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 secret weapon is Marty's background of songwriting. And we also had his son, Evan Fredrickson, on drums. He, he brought it on the album, the perfect groove. He's kind of like the modern day Jeff Beccaro, you know, like he's an amazing studio musician and brings the best out of each song. And it just, so the confidence, I felt like there was a confidence from, from knowing that we were gonna be in Marty's studio. And of course you're nervous in the beginning. Mm. We got basic ideas and stuff. You're nervous, not nervous, but you're kind of like unsure what's going to work out, I, you know, but you know that at the end, it's going to be something cool. And we, we could tell after we got a couple of songs on the board that were good, solid starting places that we knew that we were going to have a good record. And then it just got better, you know? I mean, we really love it. So hopefully everybody else will. And pretty much every track that is on that album will translate into a great event if you wanted to play any of them you know, in the uh, uh, in the in the live show i mean you could almost take the album and play the album start to finish in the show i mean have you ever thought about that doing um you know part one which is this is the new album and then doing i don't know, two, you know three or four cuts from the from the previous albums is that ever a thought because it's it, it it would be there's not one song on there that doesn't look as if it's going to be a great live track. John, I think he's I think he's onto something, but I really don't want him to know that he's onto something. Let's <laughs> tell him. Let's tell him that it was a great idea, but it's our idea. Now, from under <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, we already thought of that, Tim. We we thought of that already. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. the idea, buddy. Next, no. Anyway, you no. Know, I I, I got to tell you this about I don't know. I, it was probably six, seven years ago. My wife is a huge Iron Maiden fan. And Iron Maiden did a, a tour of America where they only did maybe five shows in yeah. America. Chicago was one of the places. So I got her tickets. I got her two tickets. I couldn't go. So her and a friend went up and they drove up. And she got back from the show. And she was pissed. <laughs> because Iron Maiden walked on stage and they played the entire new record. Yeah, and I remember. And the thing of it is, you know, like, uh, you know, at this kind of 
point in the game, I think, you know, we've done, I think, seven studio records. Um, you're never going to please everybody, but there are certain songs that people want to hear. You know what I mean? They want to hear Long Way to Go. They want to hear Make Some Noise. They want to hear, you know, they want to hear some of the new stuff. You know what I mean? So it, it, it is, it's getting a little tedious to put a set list together where yeah. we cover all the bases. But I mean, and, 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 and to boot, you know, obviously if you've been following the band, you know, there's been three singers in the band. <laughs> um, you know, so we try to do some stuff and tip the hat to John Stevens. We try to tip the hat to Glenn Hughes and, you know, and, and then fill in the blanks. So it, it's getting harder as we go. Um, and it's inevitable we're going to get off stage and we'll go meet with some of the audience members, you know, uh, you know, as we're getting back on the bus and somebody's going to go, Hey man, you didn't play, we're an American band or you didn't play, you know, uh, we all fall down or, you know what I mean? So it, it, it's hard, it's getting harder, but, uh, your idea, no, we're not going <laughs> to <laughs> touring do you view it today now with more vigor because of what everybody endured during the pandemic when a lot of people wondered whether or not we would ever get back to to seeing live music in live venues again doug well um yeah i felt that way i was wondering too if we were going to get back like like we are now, you know, with concerts and sporting events. But, you know, thankfully, um, we got through that. And we we definitely, it was the first couple of shows coming back after the pandemic were um, really exciting. Like, it just went by so fast. But as, as time's gone on, speaking for myself, I really appreciate the opportunity more than ever to be able to travel and play these songs mm -hmm. for people. And it's because... I mean, we always try to play with vigor. We always are told, you know, let's told each we tell each other, let's let's make this is the best show ever, you know. But um, and you're always trying to get better. But yeah, I, I think that the appreciation level is up there because of what we went through. Are there any specific venues then and cities in the UK that have any? special significance for you not necessarily with the with the daisies but when you look back at, at all of your your careers are there any places where you think yeah i remember that and yeah this is the place that i loved more than any other yeah, you know i'm honestly like I, i'm still a bit of a music history buff ish whatever so you know I, I i still every time i come to the uk i still think of my first trip with the screen uh you know and i was just on the yeah i just remember the plane ride over it's like oh my god i'm going to the place you know the beatles the stones pink floyd led zeppelin queen like david bowie like all these great bands came out of england um, you know, so coming over there, you know, is always a high for us. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to boot, as I said early, early, early in the conversation, you know, the UK has really embraced everything the Daisies have ever done. Mm -hmm. Um, so again i know it's the simple things in life especially after the covid thing you know i love getting together with my brothers again and coming over to england playing for the fans and then it's you know it's just cool at the end of the night to belly up to the hotel bar and sit and bullshit with doug and david and talk about the show and just have a cold pint of guinness you know what i mean it's uh, you know it, it's awesome. Do you remember the first time you played in the UK, Doug? Oh yeah, yeah. The first time I think was with Dio, and um, and it it was 
nerve wracking because of like what John said, all these bands and, and Ronnie was kind of a, I would say Ronnie was a, a wannabe Englishman. You know, he, yeah. he loved, he loved <laughs> England. He loved Britain. And, um, and so everything felt, I mean, like everything about Ronnie was, was about that. And coming to the UK was very important. And I felt a lot, a little bit of pressure and, um, so I'll never forget that. And then, of course, you know, we spend a lot of time with Whitesnake in the UK. That's one of David's biggest strongholds. And and I just think about like what John said, you know, we've been coming there for a long time and it's always something, it's always special. It's a different, the UK is just different than anywhere else in the world. There's no place like it, just like Japan, you know, it's really very unique. Even though we speak the same language, it's very unique. And the culture is definitely different. It's really cool. The tea, you know, tea time, all that stuff is like the traditions <laughs> of, of, of England and the UK is is awesome. So yeah, I was gonna say, can't wait. Can't wait. Ronnie, Ronnie was big into it, wasn't he? He was big into the to the Guinness, the the beer, the curry. He loved he loved all of that. Uh, Were there any specific aspects of of English culture, which you uh, which you took to? I mean, I know you mentioned bangers and mash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll let John tell you after. I just want to say one thing. I it's from it's from being in England that I actually got an appreciation for soccer. Oh and wow! I really. And I really didn't understand it for many years. Even when I was, I had been coming to the UK for quite some time with White Snake, and on a day off we'd go and you know it'd be England or we. I remember we were in Wales once, and it was England versus somebody. I forget. Maybe it was England and Wales, if that was possible. I don't remember. Yeah, possible. But um, it was just like the, I could. The English were so into it, and I was trying to understand. I didn't know what offsize was or any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you know and and it was now i get it now i i've learned about it and it's and it's my kind of my funnest my favorite sport right now have you got a have you got a team do you follow a specific well, team please tell me it's very, not manchester united <laughs> no I have, I have to be very careful first of all my wife is german so we have to go with the german national team or her team is fc cologne which they're right. having a rough they've had a rough few years but Glenn Hughes' team is the Wolves. I got friends. I got a married couple that are friends of John and ours. That one, one wife, the wife is Everton, and the husband's Liverpool. <laughs> so uh, we love Leeds. We love Arsenal. We love uh, you know not uh, Newcastle. We got tons of fans in Newcastle. Um, yes, we got tons of fans in Manchester. But well, they got two teams, right? Yeah, City and United. Yeah. So I mean, there's a, there's a lot. We just basically love. I love. I was watching the England Spain game and um Will Palmer put in that that equalizer that was just badass and and then the Spanish took over again after that but you know it's because of because of being in England my English friends that I actually learned about soccer. What about you John? An English item of culture that you trying to find out like Doug mentioned earlier the fact that we speak the same language but I always seem to get in trouble with uh, <laughs> it, you know I remember my first trip there uh, my my we we played a show at the Astoria theater with the screen yeah and then our drummer um, our, our drummer God bless his soul Walt he's passed away of, uh, probably seven eight years ago but he was like I cannot go back to America without having a Newcastle Brown and a whiskey. <laughs> so, like a dumbass, I decided to go with him to the Marquee Club. A band called Tiger Tales was playing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember them. Yeah. And we're sitting at the bar, and we had one, and we we're like, ah, fuck it, let's have another one. Let's have another one. Let's have another one. At this point, we're shit faced, and this guy came up to us in a pair of like zebra print leotards and hair like out to here. And he comes over and he goes, "Go a fag." <laughs> and I I looked at him and I said, uh, <laughs> "Could 
could you say that one more time? And he goes, go a fag. And I said, okay, slow one more time. And he goes, go a fag. <laughs> and Walt said, what is he saying? And I go, I don't know, dude, but I think he's calling us back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Walt kicked the shit out of this guy. <laughs> we got thrown out of the marquee. And then there's things like fanny packs with, <laughs> you know, or, or, or a makeup artist. I once told a makeup artist that she could, because I already had some makeup on. I said, you can touch me up first. And she stored <laughs> in the room. You know, so I, I, soccer, like all the other shit, it, put it to the side. I'm still trying to figure out the slang. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Last, lastly, then. Last thing. Is there anything left then for you guys that you would like to achieve on a, on a personal level in in the music business? Not not like a number one. Is there something some buddy that you would love to collaborate with that you've never worked with before? And I mean, it can be something completely off the scale. I mean, when I asked Michael Schenker this not that long ago, he, he said he'd always wanted to collaborate with um, uh, Rod Stewart. And Car Carmine, Carmine Apice said to me, well, he said, the one thing I always wanted to do, he said, was play with the police. So is there anything uh, you'd, you'd really love to do? Well, me personally, I, I, I think about like, I'm just enjoying the ride. You know, we, like, like we never know exactly what's going to happen in this life. Yeah, and, true. Uh, so, you know, I don't, if you would have told me, when I first met John, that we'd still be working together and we'd be getting ready to come and play um, the UK on a brand new record, I would have been like, and what, and how old am I again? <laughs> and it, it would have been, I would have been like, that would have surpassed my bucket list. So I don't know if I can really say like, of course, yes, we, I would love to have dinner with, with uh, Andy Summers and, and uh, have dinner with Andy Summers and, and David Gilmore and talk about things. But I mean, you never know. We might be. It might not be Andy Summers. It might be. Uh, it, it, it might be somebody else. You know that, that you know, Jimmy Page might show up and, and say, "Hey guys, you know I really like that song on the new record. Let's go. Uh, let's go have a. You know, let's go have a a, 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 a curry or something. You know, who knows? John. Well, you know, personal personally, I. You know, unfortunately, Doug's had the opportunity to meet Jimmy Page. Um, I've never met him. Uh, I have met Steven Tyler. Um, but I would love nothing more than to either sit down and try and write one song with either Jimmy Page, Steven Tyler, or Paul McCartney. Perfect. That sounds Brilliant. good, but can I add one thing? i got to yeah. be honest Jimmy Page did ask me at one point, he said, hey, this guy Karabi, how is he? And I go, he's crap. He's very <laughs> difficult to work with. You don't want it. He goes, I'm looking for somebody to write with. I go, yeah, I don't know about Karabi. He's not really your, I don't think he would, he would like what you got going on, Jimmy, and you probably wouldn't like what he's got going on. So I, there was, the, the, it came close to happening, but I put the kibosh on it. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, Basically, Robbie wears a fanny pack. <laughs> and, he's just, penny, and he doesn't want to have a fag, so. <laughs> you know. And I just got to mention, lastly, lastly, because you brought, you, you brought it up, when, when can we expect to, to, to hear the blues album? And is this an album of blues covers, or is this an album of your own blues originals? No, it's, we, we you know, it was funny, when we were down in uh, Fame Studios, it, it, it's it's actually where the studio is fully functional, but it's also a museum. Mm. And so we were just kind of looking at these photos of, well, this one room that we were, part of this room that we were in, um, if you watch the documentary, Dwayne Allman was kind of discovered there. Um, and, and, uh, and then it got to the point where, like, when they would tour, they would go there 
and rehearse in this one room. So there's all these amazing photos of, of like the Allman Brothers and Aretha Franklin and just yeah, yeah. all these legendary artists that have been through the doors of that place. And we just kind of started jamming and, um, you know, all the bands that we grew up listening to, you know, Rolling Stones, Zeppelin, Aerosmith, like, they all cut their teeth on all this killer old blue stuff. Yeah, yeah. We've made it a point. Every record, we try to do a cover. It was a act to, you know, like if you look at our record, we've done some Beatles songs. We've done some Credence, The Who, uh, Grand Funk. So we just said, okay, you know what? Let's go back a step further and and let's do some songs that, influenced that we grew up listening to mm. so we went back and we 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 found like some old robert johnson stuff muddy waters alan wolf rufus thomas uh bb king and we but i think a purist is gonna listen to this stuff and go well it's it's it they uh, it's they're not using like all these old amps and different things like that you know what i mean so yeah yeah we tried to use like without without sounding you know weird here but we took our mindset like if you look at when the levy breaks by zeppelin mm. if you listen to the original the melody is the same the lyrics are the same but they redid the music and just made it that much more powerful. So we, we kind of did the same thing. We sat in this room and we jammed. We came up with these awesome parts and we just kind of almost like, we kind of said, uh, what would Zeppelin do on these tracks? So, uh, we're excited man it's really cool everybody came to the table everybody kicked ass and uh it's gonna be a lot of fun